The title of this uh, panel is um, Aviation Technology, the Solution to uh, Humanitarian and Disaster Relief. Um, we, we have to put some caveats to that uh, straight away. Uh, the first one is that um, we were talking just, uh, just now about satellite, so maybe we need, we need to, add, to add aviation and satellite technology uh, and space technology. And uh, also uh, something that Jonathan at some point in time will want to substantiate is not maybe the solution, is one of the solutions. So that could also be a, that could also be a topic. Um, and I'd like first to uh, introduce very quickly uh, our uh, panel, uh, our panelists. Um, starting uh, uh, on my left, on your right, um, Jonathan uh, Ledger. Jonathan, uh, you have been for a long time a correspondent of The Economist in Africa, uh, and to, to such extent that you've even launched the, uh, the uh, Baobab, I, I seem to remember, blog uh, on The Economist. Uh, by the way, The Economist is excellent magazine. I subscribed to that magazine for a very long period of time. Uh, I don't have time to read it anymore. That's why I don't subscribe to it, but I, I find it's a, it's a wonderful magazine. Um, and uh, currently, you're engaged with Redline, uh, a company you would, you'll talk a little bit more about, um, and namely uh, based out of EPFL in Lausanne, uh, Switzerland. Um, Emma, um, um, Emma, your name? Finlay Broadbelt. It's quite Finlay a Broadbelt. Thanks. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, Emma is shorter. <laughs> Emma is the uh, um, CEO of uh, Phoenix Aviation, a air ambulance um, service um, with uh, a variety of uh, aircraft and, and helicopter to serve uh, Medivac uh, serve in uh, hostile areas, conflict zones, uh, basically uh, with two uh, main customers, the US DOD and uh, the United Nations. Um, and uh, Sir Martin Sweeting, um, thank you also for coming. Uh, Sir Martin Sweeting is the uh, CEO of uh, Surrey uh, Satellite. Um, and um, as the name says, you know, Surrey Satellite is about satellite technology and providing satellite technology in a variety of uh, earth sensing, earth um, um, remote sensing and observation uh, satellite technologies. So maybe I, I would like to um, um, start by saying that uh, this topic, the interesting part of this uh, session is that uh, these uh, fellows, panelists, are um, very complementary, and uh, maybe you'll have a, a glimpse of it, because we'll see, uh, we'll see uh, directly uh, what's uh, on the field, what is happening on the field with, with Emma, uh, what is the future of the support, logistic support, and actual technology brought to the field uh, with Redline, uh, and, and what you're doing, uh, Jonathan and how uh, satellite technology can complement and, and provide Earth observation to prevent, in certain cases, and add a uh, considerable amount of information and valuable data to, uh, to this. Um, maybe, uh, Jonathan, um, let, let me start with you. Um, how, um, a, a lot of companies, um, and we often talk about Amazon, about Google, working on um, how do you do the last mile of distribution. And we often don't talk about the, this mid-mile uh, situation. How is it that your company is addressing uh, particularly that particular sector? Um, thank you. Um, I, I, first of all, we're not a company, we're, we're a foundation. So, um, even though we, we set up with a uh, quite stringent uh, board and uh, oversight and have a kind of entrepreneurial outset, um, we, we have a, a philanthropic goal. Um, 
basically what we believe is um, that flying robots are going to come along um, which can carry um, precious payload, particularly for medical um, uses, but eventually for e-commerce and agriculture and so on. Um, and that perversely, that those flying robots um, have the greatest value in the poorest areas of the planet. Mm -hmm. So precisely the areas that humanitarian um, sector likes to target, um, for example, if we just look at malaria, um, if you looked at the incidence of malaria on the planet, you looked at the road networks, the failure to build road networks in the, those parts of the tropical belt of the planet, um, that is an area that, um, that flying robots could develop. Um, and when we got into this, um, we, we very quickly realized that the idea of the last mile was really not very relevant for poorer communities. Mm -hmm. um, that what was required was a middle mile, which is probably 100 to 200 kilometers range. Um, so from the nearest larger town and road to outlying town. Uh, and that over these kind of uh, ranges, then the flying robots and cargo drones uh, would be uh, time-wise and price-wise extremely competitive. There's no question, regardless of what happens with our foundation and our initiative, that this technology is going to become pervasive. Uh, the engineering is relatively simple. Uh, the regulatory environment uh, will be developed. Um, and as I say, it is precisely in those poorer regions that you're going to see it uh, move to very, very large scale. But the, the model that we have in Silicon Valley is this kind of disruptive model that the last mile um, we deliver a, a pizza or a, a, a tub of ice cream onto your lawn in Arizona. Um, and that's not the model that we'll see in Africa and uh, in South Asia. They're actually going to see small towns with 20,000 people build a drone port. Drone port will be integrated with healthcare system and logistics business um, to improve outcomes. So may I ask you, Emma, when you uh, hear Jonathan speak about these features of technology, especially for the middle mile, you are working directly on the field um, and um, serving a purpose, uh, an immediate relief purpose, humanitarian disaster relief. Um, how do you sense that aviation technology is today helping you do your work and would imagine maybe in the future that it helps you even further to uh, do your, um, your work in a, in a most efficient way? I think there haven't been particularly very many advancements in, um, in air ambulance work in the, in the last few years. It's very much a reactive um, <coughs> The, the means of moving an ICU doctor and nurse to a location, picking up patients. Um, what we find was where we could do with a little bit more advancement is things like UAVs, where we're able to have an assessment of real-time information on the field of what's happening in a particularly austere environment. Also, the dropping of medicines to to areas which are not well served by aircraft, because there never really is a perfect aircraft for any single sort of human humanitarian requirement. Mm -hmm. It's either very large, very small, very short field capability, rotorcraft, and so you need that flexibility. So your reaction time is the fastest it can be. And often things like UAVs are the answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, It'll never detract from the requirement of that human element of doctor, nurse, and you know, fixing people in field and moving them to a place where they can get better care. That will always exist. But there are times when it's very cumbersome, mm -hmm. especially when it's delivering medicines and, and also relief cargo, which we sometimes have to do in the course of what we're, we're doing, even as a medevac provider. Mm -hmm. So there is, 
I'd say again, the UAVs are the most critical um, element for us in, in just creating a more holistic approach um, mm -hmm. and a faster reaction time. Mm -hmm. So, um, Martin, when you hear um, those keywords, uh, reaction time, flexibility, um, holistic approach, what does it ring in your, uh, you know, in your, w with your knowledge, with your activity, with your uh, approach of the satellite technology? How does that fit into that model? Well, I, I think we see space as providing the uh, up-to-date, actionable knowledge that allows the, the assessment of, of, in this case, various types of, of let's call them disasters, or in, you know, things that affect uh, humanitarian concerns. Uh, one of the important things to understand in responding to any of these events is what is the scale, what are the issues, if we are sending uh, um, uh, teams in to assist it, whether, and indeed later on whether it'll be uh, um, uh, uh, drones of one sort or the other, we need to know what is the disposition of the disaster, what is the extent of it, what, are the, what is the access uh, to the area, um, and indeed if we're sending people in to try and help, what are the potential hazards? So, and of course, you know, I mean, there are many different types of disasters, earthquakes and floods. Uh, there are uh, mass migrations and so on. Um, and the key here is to have a, a quick assessment of, of the scale and the um, nature of that disaster. So one of the uh, areas where space can help is that by having fleets of satellites, <coughs> we can observe the Earth very rapidly. We can uh, bring those uh, to focus on the stricken areas and um, assess what the state is and then uh, analyze that information, turn that into actionable knowledge and then pass that down to the uh, responders. Now the responders at the moment are primarily human, mm -hmm. but of course what we will see in the course of the discussion we're having this afternoon is that that will before long become increasingly robotic in one sense or the other through autonomous vehicles. Um, and so we'll be trying to provide the necessary maps and the information on the uh, uh, disposition of the disaster. Now, the, the key with nearly all of these uh, uh, major disasters is to be able to assess and respond quickly. And this is where space can provide that uh, information because there are fleets of satellites. There is an international agreement called the International Charter on Space and Major Disasters which where uh, countries and, and commercial organizations voluntarily subscribe to providing uh, very rapid response data free of charge when there's a declared major disaster. So we can access a wide number of satellites with different types of sensors who can look at the, the stricken area and try to assess that and then provide information back to better uh, uh, enable the responders to, to do their job and to do it safely. Um, we need a, a range of different sensors on the satellites um, in order to better to cover the types of disasters, whether it be high resolution optical or radar for earthquakes, or radar when we're looking through clouds at uh, flooded areas, because flooded areas never always have, have clouds and optical satellites can't see through the clouds. So we need a wide variety of satellites um, and we also need a lot of them because we need to be able to get that information quickly. So there is a, as a, a voluntary uh, agreement uh, amongst many countries and commercial organizations that when there is a major disaster to provide that information free of charge on a best efforts basis. Mm -hmm. So having heard all of this information now, um, if we, Jonathan, if we project ourselves into a um, conflict zone um, nowadays, uh, the Darfur for instance, what is the gap that we still need to fill in order to be able to access those regions um, in terms of humanitarian relief, of course, um, without, uh, well, without necessarily having to uh, refer to traditional aircraft? <coughs> well, I think it's, it's useful if I put my old foreign correspondent hat on just to frame where, where we're heading. Um, uh, I, I think uh, natural disasters, as you say, Martin, are really critical. Um, 
but I'm very interested in persistent humanitarian emergencies. Um, uh, uh, we have uh, in the Red Line Group as one of the partners, the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross, and um, we've been looking at uh, identifying persistent humanitarian crisis. That means places like Darfur, parts of Ethiopia, pretty much all of South Sudan, large parts of Somalia, most of Eastern Congo. We can go on and on. But basically you're talking about, if you're very optimistic, 400, 500 million people, probably more realistically, a billion people on the planet for whom there will be no money in real terms to deliver the kind of response that they need. Um, as we've seen from the Syrian crisis and the inability of the European Union to get its act together, we can expect that in real terms, humanitarian aid will collapse, uh, fiscally speaking. So in those areas, you're going to have to optimize uh, innovative technology much more radically. If we take Darfur as an example, um, Moving stuff around from uh, one displaced camp, uh, which has now become a town, to another town, um, using cargo drones, I think it is a realistic opportunity within the next six, seven years. Um, but that's only going to provide, you know, 20, 30% of uh, medical diagnostics, maybe shipment of blood. Um, uh, you know, spare parts. It, 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 it's going to be a really positive contribution, but we're looking at a really um, challenging uh, medium term, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, I, I, mean, I just wonder if we can come back on a couple of points, because I think the persistent uh, humanitarian issues is a very important uh, question, because at the moment, the the, the charter that I just mentioned on uh, space and major disasters where there's this voluntary contribution of data free of charge when there's a major humanitarian disaster is managed <coughs> through the United Nations. But one of the key points of it is that it, it only persists for an order of weeks. So when there is a, a, something like the Indian Ocean tsunami, such an enormous area that was struck, space is the best way to have a look and find out the extent. But after a few weeks, when that's been characterized, everybody goes back to business, and, and, and there's no infrastructure to look at the persistent disasters. And it's sort of no, it's interesting, because if you look around you know, the audience here, it, it's a very small fraction of the previous uh, uh, seminar. And why is that? Well, there's a lot of money in aircraft. There's not an awful lot of money in humanitarian <laughs> support. And this is one of the issues that we have, is that yeah. to provide this level of support is expensive. If there is a major high-profile disaster, yes, everybody chips in. But the long-term underlying, and in some cases, much wide, more widespread disasters are not well supported because there is no, shall we call it, financial infrastructure or motivation uh, at, uh, in a commercial level to drive it. But so, I, I think Emma mentioned uh, um, fleet, fleet management. Um, if you look at like MSF running a hospital up country, South Sudan, um, they actually have to fly a plane in for any of their needs, but maybe they don't want to fly a plane all the time. Maybe they would prefer to fly a cargo drone sometimes to, to get supplies in and out. So, I mean, there is some optimization which can, which can happen. And, that'll be cheaper and more effective, yeah. Mm -hmm. Emma, when, yeah, you wanted think, to say something? Uh -huh. I think there's always a, there really always is a human element to the to humanitarian aid. Often when the, you know, the outreach programs, it means a lot for, um, for those that we're visiting to have some real time with, with individuals, you know, with nurses, with doctors, they can, you know, they can sort of explain their woes. They've got someone to talk to about the, you know, really dismal situations that they're in. And that's sometimes where an aircraft and crew and people, and they are important. Even sometimes something can be done more cost-effectively. Yes, <coughs> you could fly a drone in and you could 
you know, drop the load. And mm. But you do need that human connection. It's right. just making the most of the technology so that um, we can move faster. But it will never completely take away that, you know, that human element. Because also, a lot of things go wrong in um, when you're doing sort of disaster relief and picking up medevac cases. You get that with a lot of people involved. It tends to be fluid. You can come up with different solutions. You can task something else. You can change your focus. Whereas if things are too automated, in many respects, they're too um, distant. Mm -hmm. And nothing ever works so perfectly that you can be entirely mm -hmm. remote. You know? so, so if you, Emma, to, to you especially, if you, if you set up a, a vision of, you know, here are the patient care needs that I see today. Um, and project yourself in how would technology in a global aspect, and specifically aviation or space technology, uh, would bring and feed you with that extra mile uh, for you um, that would allow you to be you know, more reactive, more flexible, and so on. And even if you're in the wishful thinking mode, uh, what would you think about? I think the, for the large part, the technology exists. It's just that it's not necessarily affordable. Um, you know, there's, there are plenty of aircraft assets, there are a lot of sophisticated um, technological programs that are there, but they're not actually <coughs> very affordable. And that's, that really is the, the crux of it. Mm -hmm. You know, if we could tap into defense size budgets, you know, the research and development that goes into machines like the Osprey, for example, which is a civilian we would operated, we would never be able to you know, to utilize. So most of it is cost-driven. You know, these solutions, any aviation or, or aviation technology solutions at this point, it must be accessible cost-wise, right. realistically, you know. Yeah. So Otherwise, it's only ever going to be the forum of, um, of governments and also very large humanitarian aid organizations, which, as Jonathan has said, Previously, they don't have an inexhaustive um, mm -hmm. amount of funding. Mm -hmm. So, dual question. On the satellite side, how would you make that same response? What, 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 do you, what are your ambitions for, for a satellite technology that could dramatically help in these situations? Well, and perhaps before I answer that, just to pick up on this question about the human involvement, this is a very interesting one because actually it mirrors almost exactly the arguments uh, that apply to space exploration as to whether you want to have manned exploration of, of space or robotic. Robotic is safer, but the flexibility, at least certainly currently, of robots uh, doesn't yet match the human experience. Now, it's a slightly different thing in this case because it's more shall we say, empathy and flexibility rather yeah. than, than science analysis and flexibility. But it's, it's a very interesting question. I'm sure, as in the space exploration, uh, development of space exploration, we're going to see a mixture of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of essentially robotic interaction and then human interaction. Yeah. But coming back to your, your question, um, uh, actually about 10 years ago, uh, in the UK, we have been pioneering very small, low-cost and... Uh, uh, capable satellites for Earth observation alongside other applications. And one of the things that we uh, did uh, starting in around about 2003 was to construct a constellation of small satellites. And these are satellites that are about the size of two of these tables put together. Um, specifically with the view of being able to image anywhere on the Earth's surface within 24 hours. Primarily, and in fact, the name of this constellation was called the Disaster Monitoring Constellation, which sort of gives away the, <laughs> the nature of it. Um, and the intention of this was to bring together a group of half a dozen countries, each of whom would uh, contribute a satellite into this system, and then together they could provide this very rapid response. And it was used extensively during uh, the Katrina disaster, during the uh, um, Indian Ocean tsunami, and many others. And this was, the, again, a, a, an initiative which was to try to provide actionable, quick, actionable knowledge to the uh, disaster relief teams and also, to some extent, to look at some forms of 
uh, disaster prediction and prevention. So if we take that, and that has been running now for about 10 years and, and has been going very successfully, but if we look ahead, I think with the constellations that are being proposed of many hundreds of satellites uh, for communications and to, for Earth observation purposes, what we will be able to do is provide more complete coverage of the Earth with a wider range of sensors so we can discriminate between different types of, of humanitarian concerns. Um, and to provide more rapid uh, information into the, um, the knowledge bases, which would allow then the responders to make more informed decisions. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking ahead, I don't know, is it ten, five or ten years or thereabouts, I think we will see a wide range of satellites with different sensors working much more closely, I hope, with the humanitarian aid organisations of different natures. And, of course, eventually, and probably not very far off, working... In, in harmony with not just the human, but also the robotic, uh, mm -hmm. the right. UAVs and the like, the robotic delivery and, and support things. So this is going to be, um, I think, a question which actually links into the preceding session here, which mm -hmm. is how on earth do we coordinate all of this and how do we make sure not just that it's safe, but also that we get the best value out of it? Mm -hmm. Because if it's, if it's not well coordinated, we won't get the best uh, effects from it. So looking ahead, I think there's some really big opportunities in, in, in helping the humanitarian uh, mm -hmm. relief community, if I can call it that. But we've got to get the, not just the individual technologies right, but we've got to also organise the systems so that they deliver things as effectively as possible. Yep. Emma? You want I to think that, um, as usual, regulation being always yeah. quite far behind innovation, um, that's Technology my, my always big, races ahead. <laughs> yeah, my, my sort of big question is, when we look at it in the context of Somalia, which is somewhere where we, we operate and have done for the past sort of nine years frequently, the turmoil, the turmoil still exists. We still have the same infrastructure problems. Um, but how do we regulate, for example, the use of, you know, the use of the, the UAVs, you know, where you've got, different sort of conflicting, you have drones that are there for a more reconnaissance, you know, kind of application. Mm -hmm. Low-flying um, helicopters, which are sometimes hours going into remote areas where we can't actually land a, a fixed-wing aircraft. Mm -hmm. It's managing that, it's right. that regulation of um, that kind of equipment and that kind of technology. And I'm using sort of UAV <coughs> because it's my yeah. sort of reference point for what interests me at this point. Mm -hmm. I, I, actually, I could come back with a rather interesting example of exactly how policy and regulation are generally lagging a long way behind the technology. During the Katrina disaster, where obviously it would have been very advantageous to get some uh, information quickly on an area which had been where the infrastructure had been devastated, the US was unable to use its own very high resolution satellites to do that because they are prohibited by law from imaging their own people mm -hmm. with those assets. So actually the first images that were fed into the system came from outside the US, I think from one of the satellites from Nigeria, yeah. in order before the, the, the process was, was ironed out. And so it was a very good example of where policy and process you know, it, it lags the technology capabilities. Uh, and this is something I think we're going to face increasingly, particularly as we get into the combination yeah. of not just space policy, but also aeronautical and uh, right. um, uh, traffic management policy. When these two things come together, it's going to be an even bigger. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe um, I, I'd like to, at this stage, maybe ask if there's uh, a question or two um, from the audience. Any um, burning questions to our panelists here today? No? No takes on this one? Maybe, uh, Jonathan, maybe you'd like to emphasize, maybe you've been too modest about red line and uh, how when we talk about cost and the issues of how do we go on the field, reduce those costs, maintain the human factor, robotize what needs to be robotized, but do it at a, at a fair <coughs> and, and reasonable cost so that 
it doesn't become uh, a government affair anymore, uh, or not only a uh, government affair. How do you do that? How do you, can you tell us a few words about Red Line? Well, I, I think it's important to grasp the economics which are coming, um, which, you know, are at least as pr profound as the economics of the smartphone industry. And in fact, you know, um, this is the reason that I'm sitting here right now, because the bundled electronics, which are developed for smartphones, um, can more or less be uh, plugged into the brains of a, of, a, of a cargo drone. Basically, if you want to sum it up very simply, you're going to be able to fly over mountains, across lakes, in remote areas for the price of a motorbike. Mm -hmm. um, so you're going to do 12 times faster, same price. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, that's going to give you a humanitarian um, uh, offering, which is quite compelling. But as Emma uh, rightly says, in, in many cases, you want to have a human interface. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I think, pulling back a little bit, uh, we do call aerospace aerospace, but the lower sky has never really been pulled into aerospace in, in a particularly radical way. And um, I think what you will see in regulatory terms in the next uh, 10 years is <coughs> regulation of um, unmanned aircraft in the lower sky, so less than 400 meters. And it's an open question whether we as a species are willing or ready to allow unmanned aircraft to fly over our heads. Um, I think we are if the, if the value proposition is good enough and the engineering and safety is good enough. Um, uh, my lab in, in Switzerland uh, is working with the Swiss Civil Aviation Authority, uh, which has a very radical law code coming on the books this year on drones. And it basically says uh, only two things. One, if you're a drone, don't go into manned airspace ever, never. Okay. Two, if you're going to fail, you fail with minimal ground impact. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. And then you can fly over Zurich or Geneva or wherever you want. Um, so I, I feel that we're, we're, we're pushing into an entirely new space. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that'll be very um, exciting. Yeah, with, with yeah. that note, <laughs> I would say in conclusion, um, that we, we've seen the, the whole potential of things that still need to be done to be achieved. Um, first, uh, comp complementarity of information, of data that is required to do things efficiently on the ground, whether it's space uh, data, uh, ground data, access to you know, um, e efficient uh, information, from all sorts of sources. Uh, technology to bring all of those costs down and become much more affordable to, uh, to uh, access those you know, disaster and humanitarian uh, relief. And then finally, uh, UAVs, drones, to be able to do um, a, a number of things where it becomes really dangerous or ineffective to send a pilot, to send um, you know, traditional aircraft out, uh, but at the same time, keeping in mind that you cannot replace the human contact at the very, very, very last mile. You know, you, ha you have to have that uh, human approach. Is that a good summary? Any yeah. yeah. Well, let me thank you uh, all for coming. Appreciate very much. This was, a, for me, a terrific session. Hope you thank enjoyed you it, much. too. I thank each of Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you.